Welcome to the Supported Living Property Podcast with your host, me, Lisa Brown, the place to learn about supported living property investing. Hi, Joe. It's great to have you here today. How are you? Hi, Lisa. I'm well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm really good. So with a lot to talk about today, um, and I'm really interested to have you here and hear the, what you've got to say about these things. But to start with, for people who don't know you, do you want to introduce yourself and tell people a bit about you? Yeah, so my name's Joe Robinson. I run a supported accommodation service in Nottingham called Johnny Homes. Um, and we've been running since 2011. Um, my background is social work, so I was a social worker. I've been qualified as a social worker now for about 23 years, still maintain my registration, um, and also previously fostered. So I've been in the caring industry really since I was 20 when I started fostering children. So, Wow, that's but, amazing to start fostering yeah. so young. That's phenomenal. Yeah, I was fostering again recently for my sins, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was good. Great experience. Um, but yeah, I just love working with um, young people in particular. So, That's yeah. Brilliant. And and you said that you're a supported accommodation provider for people who aren't familiar with what that means, because that's quite defined now, isn't it, really? Do you want to just explain what that is? Yes. Yeah, so I work with young care leavers and you ask that's unaccompanied, unaccompanied asylum seeking young people between the ages of 16, they can go up to 25, but usually they leave by the time they're 18, although the local authority do extend some of their, um, extend the funding so that some of them do stay with us for longer than um, their 18th birthday. But predominantly under the new Ofsted that will change, but um, predominantly they leave by the time they're 18, unless the placement's extended. And that sometimes happens if it's a young person that has additional support needs and they struggle to find um, suitable move on accommodation for. So, yeah. Um, so, and so it's a, it's a really challenging group to work with, I think, isn't it? That age group, I, I imagine. It's a very challenging, but also very rewarding group to work with. Um, yes, we do have lots of challenges. Um, but yeah, but to see their progress as the young people move through, depending on what stage they come to us, because some young people come to us closer to their 18th birthday so we have less time to kind of really affect have any real lasting kind of impact on their lives but young people that come to us like earlier obviously especially the ones that are engaging tend to yeah we tend to get good results and a lot of the young people still stay in contact which is nice that's lovely that's really so nice. yeah that's when you know you're doing a good job so for those people um listening who aren't familiar with the term care leavers what do you mean by that so care leavers are young people between the ages of 16 and 18 that have been in the care of the local authority. So often they've either come from a children's home, they could have been remanded into care from the local um, through the courts, or they could have come from home. Um, they could have had placement breakdowns um, with foster carers, or they could have just had I don't know, some disruption in the family. So the local authority have taken them often voluntary into care so they can either be voluntary placed into care or they can come on a care order full care order so those that's when we use the term care leavers fabulous and so you're talking about a quite a diverse group of young people aren't you that you're supporting there with they that? are a diverse group of young people yes all backgrounds yeah all kinds of situations circumstances sometimes they come into care because of um bereavement parents are deceased or um, imprisoned or whatever so there's lots of different reasons why young people do come into care and some and of them have transitioned some have been into care, in care most of their life and they're getting to the point where they're leaving care and so you've got this really important window you haven't need to work with them really to prepare them to be able to move yes. on and take their own tenancies or you know that that's yes. a lot of work to do um, and obviously you know at that age range we know that age group even from a very stable background, have a lot of challenges. Yeah, like, absolutely. <laughs> challenges your absolutely. I tell you what's beautiful. I worked as a social worker with a ten-year-old who ended up coming to placement with us when he was sixteen. Obviously, I worked for the council as a social worker. Then, when he was sixteen and a half, he came to us. So the local authority were looking for a placement. He came to us. He stayed with us till he was eighteen. Um, did okay. Um, 
left us at 18 and he's recently applied for a job with us so he's actually going to be coming on board as a member of staff oh that's so, amazing and I wasn't part of the interview process or the recruitment process at all. So that was absolutely wonderful to know that he's doing so well that he's coming back as a um, support worker. That's yeah, it's brilliant. brilliant. And also the the fact of having that direct experience as a support worker, that's going to add a huge value to your Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And so as an organisation, obviously, um, we talked about, you know, the sort of support that you offer. What... Um, you know, this is the property podcast. We talk about sport living property a lot. What kind of properties do you have? How do you kind of set this up? Your, you know, the homes that you have, how do you organize them and set them up? Okay, so we have different homes. So we have one bedroom apartments that we set up for solo placement. So a young person that's either transitioning down into towards independence could go into one of our floating support properties. So again depending on the young person's need they might start with high intense support and then move down as they begin to develop their independent skills they then um, could move down into a one bed apartment where they then get floating support so a member of my team will go out to support them in the community depending on the hours of support their the care package the support package um, we would support them in the accommodation um, working on independent skills life skills that they need for independence um, up until they're 18 and they're moving to their own place so that's one model we also have 24 four hours basically 22 but um 24 hours on-site staff support where we have again it depends on the need of the young person so we set the homes up according to the young person's needs so if we get a referral and it needs to be like today we had a referral and it needs to be uh, um, an accommodation that's a solo accommodation so no other young people in the placement local authority are happy to pay for the full care the full hours of support not care um, but for the full support package they may say we only need 10 hours of support um, for this young person a week but they need to be on their own so they still want it staff so we just cost accordingly Right. Um, so we kind of set the properties up according to what the young people need. And then the lower end, we can have young people that maybe um, are in support where they have support for maybe nine till five, um, five days a week. And then they can contact staff outside of those hours um, if there's, there's any emergency or if they need any advice or anything. So we've kind of packaged the support around what the young person needs. So it's not like a one yeah. size fits all? no. No, I mean, some placements we can't accommodate. So some referrals come through, um, young people needing um, support that we know that we've just not got, um, we're not able to offer because you can't offer to everybody. So, yeah, and some of the some of the restrictions are accommodation. If we've not got the properties, mm. then um, we've got lots of referrals coming through at the moment, not enough properties to um, place those young people in. So that's a sticking point at the moment the real yeah. challenge isn't it for providers it all is. over the country you know all the providers in the network have that challenge don't they of trying yeah. to get the property that they need and that's obviously what we're trying to do within the sports living property network is is help you guys um with the so you talked about the one bed flats and then what other properties would you have when you're talking about maybe shared living schemes what sort of what would they be like so we also have three bed properties where we have two young people and we have we use one as an office or a staff space um, again, depending on the needs of the young person and what the support package is that the local authority request in. Um, so we currently have a young person um, with two to one, two members of staff. So staff members have a room um, and there's we only have one young person in that accommodation, but we could have two. Um, so as the level of risk decreases and we're in contact with the local authority, we could then put a second young person in that placement. So it's really fluid. Mm. And um, there's no one cap fits all model, really. What um, would be the kind of the highest number of young people you would be happy to have in one property? You know, what would be your kind of biggest number? Um, probably four maximum. Mm. Mm. Maximum, because I think it's really important that young people have the opportunity to thrive and they're in an environment where they can get the attention that they need. Um, rather than packing seven or eight young people into a property yes that's great in terms of profit but um, in terms of it's like having your own children you know the more you have is the less attention you can give to the ones that you've got so 
we tend to try and keep ours quite small. The largest is um, four that we would have. And again, it's the matching with the different young people or individual needs and making sure that um, one's not clashing with another. And that's a balance to strike with young people that have got their own challenges. Yeah, I can imagine yeah. trying to get yeah. that match right must be really yeah. hard. Yeah. And so yeah. you maybe have four, if you had went to that level and you had four young people in a property, would you then have an, one bedroom that would be a five bedroom house and one room yes. would be a staff room? Yes, definitely. Yeah, we would definitely have to have, I mean, the property has got to be large enough so that they've got space to move around. So um, a five bed, we've currently got a five bed. It's got large dining room, um, two separate offices, um, living room. So we use the small office for consultation. And if the local authority comes to visit, social workers come to visit the young person, they've got somewhere that they've got privacy. And then they've got the dining room. They've got a shared living room. And then staff have an office because there's two staff on site there. So it's always important, I think, to have enough space that people aren't crammed in together. Yeah. And, and I think that's where property investors will often, you know, on property investor training courses, people are trained, mm -hmm. aren't they, to squeeze as many bedrooms in as they can out of a floor Yeah. Plan. Um, yeah. and I think when we're talking of the needs of you guys, often you're you're going, well, actually, no, I don't want all this. I need some of that living space back. We need yeah. to make sure we've got that. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Because even though we've got like we've got head office, but actually when staff are working on site, they need access to a computer, they need access to equipment, printers and so on, so that they can do the work with the young people that they're meant to be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and they can't do that if they don't have the equipment based at the home that they're in. I mean, if it's floating support, it's different because they'll take their laptop out they'll do the work with the young person and that connects to our server. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's, you know, if it's intense work that we're doing and staff are on site 24 hours, then they definitely need their own dedicated office space. Yeah. And yeah. also bathroom or at least toilet. For the yeah, staff so to use. Yeah. For the staff to use. Yeah. So ideally we would, the five beds got two bathrooms. Mm -hmm. and, would you rather um, they were on suite bedrooms or are you happy to have shared bathrooms? um you mean for the young people mm. um again that doesn't matter so much I mean we've had properties we had one property that we leased for a while that was six bed and each room was en suite so it's a bit like an HMO mm. kind of setup um and that works well for some young people and it only had a one communal area but all they had their own kitchens and everything right. um kitchenettes and so on um so that's more of an HMO kind of mm. style individual because I know most some HMOs they share the kitchen don't they and um mm -hmm. but yeah that was set up in a different way that worked quite well especially for young people that were closer towards independence yeah. um and staff would probably go in nine to five and one of those rooms would be kept for staff mm -hmm. so any property works depending on the young person that needs that kind of um accommodation but I think for the larger ones you definitely need any apart from I'd say that most of them you definitely need space for a staff at least to have um, a staff room mm. yeah and the and level of, like the kind of quality of finish that you're looking for because I know a lot of property investors and people generally have in their mind oh supported accommodation doesn't need to be such high standard it can yeah. be you know it's not quite what I'd do for the private rental sector so it's right for supported living I get that yeah I don't like those conversations but I do get those mm. but what would you say to that Jo? and that's a big problem because we have landlords that understand the model and that's why the work that you do is absolutely brilliant because you're kind of getting landlords to understand, investors to actually understand what this is about because we've been offered properties and we've gone into those properties and I thought, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have an animal living in here. And if it's not, as I said to you before, if it's not good enough for me, and I know we all have our own standards, then it's not going to be good enough for the young people we work with. So we want properties that are good quality properties you know we're not saying they need to be half a million pound high spec marble kitchens mm. but we're looking for clean you know nice flooring um lovely lighting um decorated you know not with I don't know plaster all over the wall unfinished and so mm. on so properties that are done to a good standard is what I would say that we are looking for mm. and then we maintain those and that's the thing, isn't it? Once you get yeah. handed over something that's in a good standard, then you you guys yeah. maintain it and keep it to that level. Yeah. Whereas in the early days, we took on properties that needed a lot of work, a lot of work, um, new bathrooms, kitchens, and we've put those things in. 
Mm. because we've had an arrangement with a landlord to be able to do that but no we want properties that we can just you know collect the keys and they're ready to practically move into just furnish yeah 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 and that's what you should be able to get hold of you know that's what you know yeah that's what these yeah is there isn't it it's good quality pro- they've had enough challenges they don't need a rubbish property as well to add in exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> So what are the challenges that you're facing at the moment as a supported accommodation provider? I mean, there's there is a whole load of things going on in the sector, isn't there? But mm. what would you say your main challenges? Well, one of the challenges was getting registered with Ofsted because that's a quite a big thing now. Well, it's, mm. it's a massive thing now because providers can't operate, um, whereas before they could get a property and just kind of get a business set up and get moving. Now, and I think you... just to sort of give that context, Joe, for people who aren't familiar with it, that if you were supporting care leavers up above 16 years old you never used to be registered with no. Ofsted or anybody really did you you were kind of no and and that meant some great providers like you guys carried on delivering great service but there were a lot of cowboys in the sector weren't they jumping in and, and not absolutely with service and I think this is the reason why um they decided that they were going to go ahead with registration um so yes yeah, so, so so now you have to be registered don't you if you're supporting people between 16 and 18 um that's yes. right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah yes so Ofsted um decided that okay I think lots of research has been done and so from October the 28th 2023 a provider cannot carry out this service supported accommodation as it's now called unless they are registered with Ofsted so you can't just get a property and decide that you're setting up and even the providers that were operating prior to, if they are not, if their applications weren't in by the 28, couldn't consent, couldn't continue either. So it's a lot tighter and stricter as it should be. And it's also standardized now, I think. So everybody's policies and pursuit, we're all operating to one standard, or we will be by April, um, which I think is a very good thing for young people because I think they need that consistency across the board. Mm. But as a as an operator, that's been a challenge to get registered, has it? It has been a challenge, yeah, because it's men. I mean, obviously, we had all our policies and procedures, um, but it's making sure that whereas before you weren't accountable. I mean, we always had the local authority coming out once a year anyway and kind of doing an, an inspection and they would give us an action plan if there was anything that we needed to um, improve on, which was brilliant. But I know that's not standard across the board. So we've been kind of operating to that standard already, but it's kind of making sure you've got all your ducks lined up. Um, yeah, um, so that was quite a challenge and uh, make sure you've got your registered service manager and registered individual, whereas before it was just, if you had a director in the company, that was fine. So yeah, and um, providing all the paperwork that is required, which was quite a task, quite a task. Um, so yeah, so that's something that's new. So, so I know that, that it will be a bigger cost now for new providers coming on because they've got to make sure that they've got the property. They have to have their staff in place. Um, they certainly can't get any placements anyway until they're registered with Ofsted. So more like the children's home operators having to have more like a child- lined up. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So once you've submitted your application, then it's the telephone interview, but then it's the registration visit. So they come out and um, check the property, check the policies and procedures, speak to your staff, speak to the young people. So it is very much like setting up a children's home now. Yeah, yeah. which means there's a lot more outlay for um, the whoever's setting up the company than there was previously. It's going to be interesting to see whether that affects the amount of placements and homes that are available, isn't it? You know, whether that's going to reduce them, what do you think it will? I think it will. I think from my discussions with the local authorities, we've got loads of referrals flying through Mm -hmm. and that's because their pool of providers has um, dropped because some, um, for whatever reason, um, some providers either weren't able to meet the standards or whatever, but they decided that they weren't going ahead with um, the registration process. So you can imagine, I think the local authorities were struggling before. Mm. So to have a reduction, what that number is, I don't know. No. But to have less providers with the same demand, if not more, increase in terms of placements required for young people. Yeah, that's so. So yeah. that's one of the big challenges you're you faced. But it sounds like you're getting through that one. Yes, <laughs> yes, we're getting through that. That's one of the big. And then the other big challenge is properties. Mm. Mm. Trying to get properties that are good quality properties um is a a big challenge Mm. up to now yeah and why do you think that is 
because a lot of the landlords don't understand supported accommodation, mm. supported living, as it was called. They don't understand it. They don't understand what the requirements are. Uh, they think that they can just under property. They don't realise that, you know, the legislation in terms of the fire doors, the, the health and safety, fire safety, all these things have to be put in place. And I can understand a landlord not wanting to go to those extents if they don't want to. And it's probably not for everybody anyway. Mm. Um, but I think that's what sets the kind of landlord apart for the kind of landlord that we're looking for. Mm. Yeah, they're not onerous things you're asking for, are they? You're asking for sort of like a good quality property that meets the regulations and has fire, you know, fire doors as an HMO fire doors. anyway. Is that right? Yeah. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, one of the properties we've just put fire doors in because we've had it for quite a while. The landlord didn't want to do any work. Mm. um so we've put the fire doors in it's not just the doors we've all the frames have needed changing yeah. to accommodate the fire doors that are thicker so it, uh, the landlord wasn't really understanding all that um but we've had the property for quite a while to be fair so we were we were happy to do that but we wouldn't be doing that again because obviously it's not our property no no there needs yeah. to be some recognition in the rent or something doesn't it if you're putting that yeah up. i think it's just though negotiating with a landlord i think it's just being reasonable isn't it um you know, the landlord probably doesn't want to foot 100% of the bill mm. if the rent is going to be the same as an AST. So, yeah. yeah, you know, which I completely understand as well. But I think mm. in terms of the long haul and having one company running that and also taking care of it, not having to worry about voids and worry about the property being damaged and so on, because we obviously we work with the local authority. So if there's damage to a door, it's repaired within a couple of days. Mm. You know, we can't we can't have it sitting around. Um, with the door hanging off we've got to maintain that standard all the time and that's the thing if you're leasing your property to a good quality provider you know who's meeting those regulations on those standards like you say you're going to be penalized if you're if someone comes around mm. and inspects you and the property's in a poor state so you know, yeah you've got to maintain it haven't you really to keep well it's it. inspection it's inspection but it's also social workers visit um families visit and this is their our young people's homes our staff take the shoes off they wear slippers they're not allowed to go in with shoes on so we have to respect the fact that it's their home and we need to maintain it as we should be doing our own homes so yeah. and looking after the landlord's property as well and that's the thing isn't it I think you know with supporting them there's so much that's mm -hmm. all over the place at the moment supporting living in social media and I know I've been talking about this a lot yeah. recently but you know there's a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon thinking it's easy thinking it's great mm. to get into and not really understanding who they're leasing properties from or to and really not getting their heads around it at all if you, if you do due diligence you work you find a good provider to work with you make sure you're working with the right person mm. you know then then actually it's such a great way to hold property for the long term it really is you know it is and I think that relationship because you know we wouldn't want to be working with the five or six landlords it's so much easier mm. to have a couple of landlords that you're working with mm. um that you can build so we can build and they're you know it's it's a win-win situation situation isn't it yeah and absolutely. I think it's developing that relationship so that they understand what we're doing and you know we've had a landlord that's wanted to actually volunteer to come and do some work with the young people because of his own background himself mm. so mm. which has been brilliant that's great that's great if it's the right person sometimes I yeah. speak to landlords who kind of get a bit excited about the fact that it's gonna you know they're gonna be able to get involved in the support side of things Mm. And that can be great if they're a good fit, but like you say, if you they're know, right fit, yeah, yeah. But sometimes yeah. I think it's managing people's expectations a little. Absolutely, better, isn't it? absolutely. Right. I mean, the landlord I'm talking about, he came from care himself, so yeah. that's why he was happy to offer us the property that he had because he said he wanted mm. to give something back. But yeah. Yeah, it just depends on the person. I just, I know from some of the conversations I've had, I'm thinking, I know some of my providers wouldn't be very happy with you popping around for a cup of tea and others would actually think that would be really good. So it, it yeah. just it's the relationship, isn't it? It's the, yeah. And also, as you say, um, managing expectations. So, mm. you know, it's only happened once and we've been very clear, okay, he's into football, this young man's into football. So he's picked him up once a fortnight, taken him to football, Brilliant. dropped him back and that's it. So yeah. he's not knocking on the door every two minutes. No. No, I think yeah. people sometimes have this image that oh, I'm going to come around and mentor these young people and teach them business and oh, teach them no. to do things and, and maybe sit yeah. there and expect they're going to sit there and have a cup of tea with someone and that's not necessarily. No, right. there's a line. I think the line is you need to be very clear at the beginning, I think, where the line is and boundaries. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. But like you say, it can yeah. just it's such a great way to hold property, but also to know that you're making a real difference whilst you're you're holding absolutely. property. I think it's absolutely. Absolutely.
but you know i'm as probably anyone on listening to this by now is already converted because i probably talk all the time but <laughs> it is it's just you know it is i think it's a very very powerful way to invest in property you know and make yeah. a difference to people's lives yeah so thank you for sharing your experiences it's been really really good to hear all the things that you've shared with us and, and talked about um we'll pop your contact details in the show notes and if people want to get hold of you then they can do that there so thank you thank you lisa thank you